What is up guys, my name is John and this is my tutorial on my marketplace asset, the flexible combat system. If you're watching this, then there's a good chance you purchased my asset. So I just want to say a quick thank you for that. I'm currently working full time trying to become an Unreal Engine 4 tutorial and content creator. So by purchasing my asset, you're really helping me out and supporting me to achieve that dream. So again, thank you so much. So what are we doing in this video? Well, today we'll be covering a range of topics from setting up the combat system to teaching you how it works to adding a new character and weapon style. I'll try and go as fast as possible while giving you all the bits of information you need. And if by the end of the video, you're still confused about something, I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. I'd also really recommend checking out some of my other tutorials because a lot of the work built into this system has been partially made in one of my previous videos. So hopefully they'll be able to clear up the rest of your confusions. It's going to be quite a long one today, guys, but by the end of the video, you will be fully equipped to use and adapt the system for your project and you'll have a badass looking character you can run around and kill things with. So stick with me on this, we'll get through it together, let's do it. So first, let's cover how we can implement this asset into a pre-existing project. Unfortunately, I had to list the asset as a complete project due to certain Epic Games regulations. So you can skip this step if you're happy using the asset as a starting project. So create a project with the marketplace asset then right click the flexible combat system folder and migrate it over to your existing project. Once you're in your project, go into the world settings in the bottom right. If you can't see this tab, look in the top left under window, add the world settings tab here. On the world settings for your game mode, select BP underscore game mode with two E's. Now we're gonna get the nodes to bring up our menu widget. So back into our asset project, we're gonna go to the blueprints open the level blueprint and we're just going to copy our toggle menu nodes and our create menu widget nodes. Then go into our other project and we're going to jump into the level blueprint again and paste these nodes in. Change the custom event to an event begin play and right click the menu WB variable to create it. And that is everything you need to bring the asset pack into your game. If you're throwing AI into your level, all you need to do is place down a nav mesh throw an AI into the map, select it and type in a sign into the details section. This will bring up all the customizable variables such as weapon style, experience, health, etc. And that is it. If you press play now, you should spawn in as your character with everything working correctly. If your character stats all say zero, it's because you'll have created a save game before loading in your character. So just play your level, open the menu with M and click the restart level button. This will delete the save game and create a new one with our character. Now, if you press play, everything should be working. Great. So what's next? Before we can get into any of the cool, exciting stuff, I think it's important to give you a really quick overview of how the main part of the system works. I'll try and make it as fast as possible so we can get into the good stuff. So here we go. So let's jump into our character blueprint. In the first event graph, we have a summary of all the different event graphs and what's included in each. For now, we're purely gonna focus on how the character animates with different weapons. So, there's a few weapon interactions inside our character blueprint. We have picking up weapons, drawing and sheathing our weapon, and firing off attacks and blocks. Each weapon interaction, apart from picking up the weapon, has a play and in montage node attached to it and the animation for each play anim montage is a blank variable. And this is where our weapons come into play. Each weapon blueprint has a struct variable called item info, where it holds all the information about that weapon. So when we go over to a weapon, interact with it and pick it up, all this information is passed to the character, meaning those blank anim montage variables we had earlier are now filled with whatever animations were set in the weapon. So whenever we want to change weapon style, we simply load those animations onto our anim montages. Each weapon has its info stored inside its blueprint, except the fists, which is stored in the character because you don't pick them up. And that covers all the anim montages. But what about the movement animations specific to each weapon? So let's take a look at the animation blueprint. As you can see, the animations outputted are all dependent on our weapon type enum, which changes when we pick up a weapon. So we've got our weapon states here, 
and we output one depending on our weapon type enum. If our character is blocking, we'll also blend a block animation into our movement. Then we'll store our movement and block as a cache called current state. We then blend in our default slot, which allows our anim montages to play, and we call this current state with slot. Then depending on if our character is accelerating or not, we either blend in our anim montages at the pelvis, meaning they impact the entire body, or we blend them in at the spine, meaning they just impact the upper body. This means we can attack while moving if accelerating, or play the normal attack animation if standstill. Okay, let's jump into a weapon state. So each weapon state is almost identical. We have our standard third person movement and jumping, which applies to all weapons. We then have our crouch state and our crouch locked on target state. These are the same for each weapon. The only difference between the weapon states is our target lock on state, which uses combat movement animations specific to each weapon. The weapon hold state you see right here is simply a one frame long animation of the player holding the weapon. This is used when using the third person movement to prevent the character from holding the weapon at a bad angle. As for the event graph, everything is fairly self-explanatory. Is in air, speed and direction variables are all created using some calculations. Then we're passing some variables from the character blueprint to the anim blueprint. And finally, we're setting the acceleration. Acceleration is as simple as checking if the character is moving and setting it accordingly. However, some of the weapon attack animations cause the player to spin in the air, meaning when they're run, they need full body control. And if you remember, in the anim graph, the animations only get blended in with full body control if accelerating is false. So what I've done here is add in some conditions to turn the acceleration off during certain animations. An anim notify is basically an event that is triggered by an animation. We have two events here on when to attach and detach our weapon to our hand and back. We have a combo attack notify which enables combo attacks. And we have two notifies on when the hit trace for our weapons should be active. And that team is all the very basics of the character animation. I hope it wasn't too boring, but it's something we just had to get out of the way before we could move on to some more exciting things. Now you've got an idea of how the character works, let's create a new weapon attack style. And to add a new weapon attack, you will need the following animations. At least one attack animation. You can have as many or as little attacks as you want. A block animation. This animation can be whatever length you want. A frame long, 100 frames, it doesn't matter. A draw weapon animation. You'll need an animation of your character drawing his weapon. This can be anything from a spin animation to an animation of your character grabbing the weapon. A sheath weapon animation. For this, I'd recommend duplicating your draw weapon animation and putting it in reverse. But of course, you can make your own unique sheath weapon animation if you want it. A group of locomotion animations. You'll need an idle, a strafe forwards, backwards, right and left animation. These are the movement animations that go with the weapon. Walking locomotion animations. These are exactly the same as the other animations, but they play at a slower speed, making it look like the character's walking instead of running. An assassination animation. And of course you will need a weapon. And if you want a particle system specific for that weapon, you'll need one of those. In today's tutorial, we're gonna be adding staff combat, and I've got all the required bits and pieces you need. So jump into the description and follow the Staff Combat download to download everything you need. While that's downloading, I just wanted to say that these animations are just for demonstration purposes, so they're not perfect, but they'll do the job for now and you can use them in your game if you wanted. Also, both ranged and magic attacks are compatible with this system, but you'll need to add some functionality, which we won't be covering today. But sometime in the future, I'll definitely work on adding those features to the system. When the files are downloaded, Copy and paste the folder into your project content folder in your file explorer. Now we need to add this weapon type to our weapon equipped enum. So double click to open up your enum, click new and call this staff. Save and close this. Now let's jump into our skeleton. What we need now is two sockets. One on the back where the weapon will sit and one in the right hand when equipped. So of course we could use a previously made socket if it's in the right position. But none of the sockets we currently have are, so let's make a new one. First we'll add one for the back. So right click the spine free and add socket. Rename this to staff shift socket. 
And now we need to position this correctly. So what we can do to make this easier is right click the socket, add preview asset and add the staff. Then move it into a position you like somewhere on the back. Now let's do the same, but for a socket attached to the right hand. So under your right hand bone, right click, add socket and call this staff drawn socket. Now we're going to do the same and preview the staff mesh again and position it so it fits in the hand. So what we can do now to make sure we've positioned these sockets correctly is preview our animations. First, preview an attack animation which corresponds with the weapon. As these animations include animation of the actual weapon itself, we'll never be able to get it perfect for every attack, so just get it roughly lined up. Then if you're using a draw weapon animation which shows the character precisely picking up and drawing the weapon, what you do is preview the draw weapon animation. Then when the character grabs the weapon during the animation, move the weapon sheathed socket until both the weapon previews line up. This means when we swap our weapon from our back to our hand, the weapon won't teleport over to the other socket. As we're just using a 360 spin to draw our staff, we don't need to worry about this. Now let's sort our animations. So select all your attack animations, right click and create an in montage. We convert our attacks to montages so we can easily call them in our character blueprint and blend them. Now we need to add some anim notifiers to them. So hop into your first attack. So what we need is three notifiers. A hit ready notify. This will begin a line trace and allow our weapon to deal damage. This should be placed at the start of our weapon swing. Hit not ready. This will stop our line trace, stopping our weapon from dealing damage. This should be placed at the end of our weapon swing. And attack sequence next. This is to do with our combo attacks. If a player sends off another attack before this notifier is triggered, the next attack will fire off when this notifier triggers. This should be placed at the frame you want your next attack animation to run. Once these are done, we then need to do the same for our other attacks. So I'll fast forward this bit and see you guys afterwards. When you've done three notifies in all your attacks, jump into your attack D. So each montage will blend in and out from the last animation depending on the blending settings. As our character spins so fast in a few frames, if we give him a blend in time of 0.25 seconds, we're actually going to be skipping over the spin. So what we need to do is change this blend in time to 0.1 seconds instead of 0.25. Also, as this is a full body spin attack, after he lands, we need to blend him back in with the leg movement as fast as possible. Otherwise, he'll float across the floor. So let's give it a blend out time of 0.9 seconds. As his feet hit the ground, roughly 0.9 seconds before the end of the animation. Now what we'd usually do is open up our draw and sheath weapon and in montages. And we'd add a notify on each. One to attach the weapon to the hand and one to attach the weapon to the back. We're going to be using the already implemented two-handed draw and sheath weapon animations, so this is already done for us. But if we take a look at our axe and shield draw weapon, you'd place the attach weapon notify at the point in the animation where you want the weapon to attach to the hand. Then for the sheath weapon, you'd bring in the unequip notify at the point in the animation where you want to attach the weapon to the back again. Cool, we're all done with our attacks. Now we need to sort our movement. So hop into the animation folder, let's duplicate a jog blend space, it doesn't matter which. Call this bs underscore staff jog and double click to open it up. Now we need to replace all the current animations with our staff ones. So at the top we have our strafe movement animations, at the bottom we have our idle animation and in between we have a walking version of our strafe animations. These walking animations are exactly the same as the strafe movement animations, but they have a reduced play rate. You can set this in the details when you open up an animation. So drag and drop your staff animations in at the following points. Now let's save this and jump into our animation blueprint. 
then hop into the anim graph. Let's add in our new weapon. So right click on the blend poses and add your staff to the enum. Duplicate our dual wield state by selecting it and pressing Ctrl W. Rename the comment and the name of the states and caches to fit our staff. When you've done this, let's plug this into our enum. Now let's jump into our state and into our idle slash run lock state. What we're going to do is swap in our newly created blend space. Don't forget to connect the variables into it. Then go back and jump into your block state. Into our block start, we're going to pull in our 200 block animation and swap it in. OK guys, animation's all sorted. Now we just need to set up the weapon. So jump into the blueprints folder and then into our weapons folder. We're going to right click and duplicate our 200 weapon blueprint and call this blueprint staff. Double click to open it up. In the viewport, change your mesh over to the staff. Then we need to move our line trace start and end to the start and end of the weapons blade. As this staff doesn't have a blade, I'm going to put my start halfway up the staff and the trace end at the end of the staff. So between these two points is where our line trace will be generated and where the weapon can collide with enemies. Now hop into the event graph. I'll explain more of what's going on in here later in the video, but for now we're just going to set up the weapon settings. So for weapon info, put in BP staff for class, staff for weapon type, however much damage you want the staff to deal, however many combo attacks your weapon has, in this case we have four, then change the anim montages over to the newly created anim montages. So staff attack A, attack B, attack C and attack D. And for the draw and sheath weapon, we're going to be using the two handed draw and sheath weapon animations. So put those in. Now let's move down to our line tray setup. For the particle system, put in our staff hit particle system. We don't pass the particle system over to the character, so it's not placed in with the rest of the info. One more thing to do, and that is on our attach and detach weapon, we need to put in the bone names we made earlier. Mine was called Staff Sheathed Socket for the back and Staff Drawn Socket for the hand. The spelling and capital letters need to be exactly how you spelt it on your socket. So copy and pasting the name from the skeleton isn't a bad idea. So you'll notice that when we're moving and we draw our weapon, our character's body spins around, but his legs continue moving. And that's because of what I talked about earlier with the accelerating variable. When we're moving, the animations get blended in from the spine upwards. So what we need to do is tell the program to give full body control to the animation when drawing and sheathing our weapon and using our last combo attack, as these are all spin animations. And if you remember correctly, we do this by telling the program we're not accelerating. So jump into the anim graph event graph. Let's move our accelerating nodes down. So first, when we're drawing or sheathing our weapon, we want to give full body control. So let's duplicate our two-handed weapon nodes and swap it over from two-handed to staff. Now if our staff is equipped and we're drawing or sheathing our weapon, we're going to set accelerating to false. Cool, that's done. Now if our last combo attack is active, we also want to give full body control. So let's copy our dual wield if attack count is four. Then let's duplicate our if weapon equals staff with control W. Plug these together with a AND bool. So if our attack is on attack 4 and we have our staff equipped, give full body control. Let's connect both these conditions up together with an OR node and plug this into our condition. So we've added the attacks, but what about the assassination? First let's turn our assassination animation into a montage. So right click, create an in montage. Then jump into the character blueprint and go to the assassination event graph. Let's duplicate the dual wield assassinate line and set the enum to staff. Then we're going to change the animation over to our staff assassination animation and change the minus node to around one second. If this value is one, our AI will play his death animation one second before the end of the player assassination animation. And that's all you need to do. 
I know I didn't explain too much, but don't worry, I'll go over some more information when I come to the assassination section of this video. And that's everything guys. It may seem like a lot of work at first, but without all the explaining I had to do, you can add a completely new attack style into your project in about five to 10 minutes. Not bad. On your screen now is a step-by-step -step list of what you need to do, so you can easily come back to this image and add more attack styles in the future. Okay, that's for the character, but what about if we want to add a new combat style for the AI? And for the AI, because they share the same skeleton, almost all the work is already done. So first let's jump into our enemy AI animation blueprint and hop into the anim graph. We're going to duplicate the two-handed state. Again, rename all the different states, caches and comments to staff. Then right click the enum and we're going to add our staff state again, then plug in our state. Jump into the staff state machine. As AI doesn't have any target locking or crouching, the state is a lot simpler. All we need to do is jump into our idle slash run state and change the blend space over to our staff blend space. Now jump back into our character anim graph and go to the event graph. Copy all our acceleration staff conditions and jump back into the enemy AI anim event graph. Paste these into the same position we had them set up in our character. Then change the player ref to our AI ref and bring in the AI mid draw wep anim variable and our attack count variable. Compile and save this, then jump into our blueprints folder. Weapons, then AI weapons. Duplicate the AI two handed weapon blueprint and call this BP underscore AI underscore staff. Go into the viewport and change the mesh and adjust the line traces just like we did before. Then hop into the event graph and change the particle system to our new staff particle system. Then change the socket names to the sockets we made earlier. As our AI start with weapons and don't pick them up, all the weapon info is inside the AI blueprint. So jump into your enemy AI blueprint. Jump into the weapon interactions event graph and jump into our setup weapon function. Duplicate the dual wield weapon and paste it below. Connect this up and plug it in like the others. Now we just change everything over to our staff weapon. So equipped weapon enum equals staff, change the comment to staff info, then change all the info over to our staff, just like we did for our character. Make sure for the class, you put the AI staff, not the normal character staff. Okay, just one last thing to do. Back in the blueprints folder, jump into AI, then jump into the AI controller. Now we need to set how close the AI will run up to us depending on our weapon. So where it says setting the AI attack range, duplicate the bottom line and change it over to staff and give it a range of around 200. And we're done. Now when you place the AI into the level, you can freely swap it over to staff combat. Now let's talk about replacing our mannequin with a new character. And you have three choices for this. Either you use a character which has the same skeleton as the mannequin. This is the best and fastest option. Or you can retarget the animations from your mannequin to your character. And the last option is to create new animations for your own character to replace the existing ones. I personally wouldn't recommend this option unless you've got some kind of company as there are a lot of animations to reproduce. So to put it simply, if your skeleton is the same as the mannequins, use option one. If your character has a different skeleton to the mannequins, use option two. And if you've got yourself a badass company and want to make perfectly handcrafted animations, use option three. Okay, let's go through them. Option number one. If your character's skeleton is the same as the mannequins, simply re-import your character and select the mannequin skeleton. 
Now this will only work if the hierarchy is the same and all the bone names are the same. Now you've done this, your character will be able to use all the animations that your mannequin was using. So all we need to do is go into our blueprints, open up our character blueprint, into the viewport on the mesh, change this to your new character mesh, and voila, you're done. Okay, option two, retargeting the animations to your character. Now this is a bit of a bigger job, but it's nothing too difficult, just a lot of animations and settings to change. If you have any experience with retargeting animations, then great, but if not, nothing to fear. Retargeting is basically the process of allowing animations to be played on a skeleton they weren't designed for. So we're going to start by opening up our character skeleton. Into the retarget manager, under select rig, select the humanoid rig. Begin matching up the mannequin's bones with your bones. To show the bone names, click character, bones, bone names. The name should be different, but the general position should be similar. So just match all the bones up. I'm going to fast forward this bit. Now we're going to move our character into a similar pose to our mannequins. So rotate your bones around until he's in a similar pose. The closer your pose is to the mannequins, the better the animations will retarget. When you're done, click Modify Pose, Use Current Pose. Okay, get ready for a crazy amount of animations. Jump into the animation folder and right click the player character and in BP. Click retarget and select your rig. You should see that your skeleton pops up next to the mannequin and it's in the same pose you made earlier. If you can't see your skeleton here, click cancel and try retarget a single animation and then try again. Sometimes the mesh doesn't appear the first time round. If you can see your skeleton here and it's in the correct pose, we're ready to retarget the entire animation blueprint. By doing this, we're going to be creating around 90 animations. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to try retargeting one animation first to see how well the animation retargets. Remember, the closer your character's pose is to the mannequins, the better the animations will retarget. But if you're happy, click retarget. Now we're going to jump into our montages folder and select all the montages by clicking on one, then shift clicking on one on the other side of the folder. We're going to right click and duplicate and retarget these. Now we've got all the animations. All that's left is to swap the animations over and change a few small details. And I know there's a lot of animations, but I'd recommend renaming them so you can tell them apart from the original mannequin animations. You'll only ever have to do this once, so when it's done, it's done. When you're ready, we're going to jump into our character blueprint, into the viewport, and swap our mesh over to our new mesh. And then give our mesh the newly retargeted animation blueprint. Now if you press play, you should be able to move your new character and crouch with control. Now we need to change our montage animations and a few bits of information related to the skeleton. Now let's jump into our animation blueprint. Then jump into the anim graph. We blend our animations together using these layered blend per bone nodes. And we specify what bones to blend the animations at inside the node. But as we're using a new skeleton with new bone names, we need to swap these old bone names for our new ones. For our moving pose, click on the blend node. We need to change our bone name from spine to whatever our spine bone is called in our character. So jump into our character skeleton. If your leg bones are attached to your pelvis, then you can use your first spine bone name. If your legs are attached to a bone further down into the hierarchy, like the spine, take the highest bone in the hierarchy which the legs aren't attached to. For this skeleton example I'm using, for some reason the legs are attached to the spine instead of the pelvis. This is very uncommon and I don't know why the creator created the skeleton like this, but it means I need to take spine 1 instead of spine 0. Just make sure the legs aren't attached to the spine bone you're copying. If they are, go down to the next bone. For most of you, the first spine bone will be the correct bone to use. When you found the correct bone, select it. Mine is called Bip Spine 1. Copy the name and jump back into your animation blueprint and paste that name into the layered blend per bone node where it said spine. Now for our still pose. 
We're going to do the exact same thing, but for our pelvis bone. Mine's called Bip Pelvis, so I'm going to put that in. Click back onto your moving pose and recopy the spine bone name. There's a few more layered blend nodes we need to change. First, jump into your fist block state, then into your block start, click on your layered blend node and paste your new spine bone name into here. When you've done this, we're going to go back and we're going to do this for each of our block states. We have one for each weapon. I'm going to fast forward this bit. And that's the animation blueprint done. Now it's time for the sockets. So jump into your mannequin skeleton in the mesh folder. In the options, we're going to select show all sockets and then hide all bones. Now this part is going to be a bit tedious, but for each socket, what I need you to do is copy and paste it onto the corresponding bone for your character. If you've got the same bone names as the mannequin, you can just copy and paste all the sockets and they'll go on to the correct bone. But I don't. So I'm going to copy all the sockets one by one. So on the right hand bone, I'm going to select all the sockets by control clicking or shift clicking them. Then I'm going to copy them with control C. Then I'm going to jump over to my other character, find his right hand bone and paste these sockets onto the selected bone. So these sockets might be a bit out of position in comparison to the mannequin. So what you can do is right click on the socket and preview the weapon on them. Then to take this even further, you can preview the attack animation corresponding to that weapon. Once you've done this, you can line up the weapon into the appropriate position. Anyway, I'm going to leave this up to you guys to finish. I will see you when you've copied all the sockets from the mannequin skeleton to the character skeleton. Now we need to change over all our anim montages to use our new character's anim montages. So jump into your character blueprint. And whatever event graph you are currently in, it doesn't matter, we're going to bring in a play anim montage node. Then we're going to right click and find references. Now in our find results, we have a list of all our anim montage nodes and we can click through them. So delete the anim montage we created, then starting from the top, let's click through them. And every time we have an anim montage with an animation inside, we're going to swap it over to our newly created animation for our new character. If you didn't rename your new animations, you can look at the file location and know the difference between your old animation and your new one. So, in total, you should have changed two hit impact animations, a block impact animation, all the assassination animations, and the roll animation. Now, if you remember correctly, the rest of the anim montages are all stored in the weapons. However, the fist animations are stored in the character blueprint. So if you look through the functions for the one that says set attack stance fists, double click to open that up. Then when that's open, change over all four animations to our newly created ones. When that's done, jump out of the character blueprint and hop into the blueprint folder, weapons. Open up all your weapon blueprints. Then for each weapon, swap over attack A, B, C and D and the draw and sheath weapon from the old mannequin animation to the same animation but for your new character. Obviously we've already done the fists. And now the very last thing to do is go into your fist blueprint and change the attach bone name from the mannequin's hands to your character's hands. And guys, that is it. Good job, that was a long one. Okay, let's talk about and customize some systems. So we have two structs and structs are basically a list of variables. We have one struct for holding the weapon information and we have another struct for holding the character stats that's stored in the save game. Enums. An enum is basically a list of values and we have two of them. One which contains all the different types of AI behavior, which is used in the behavior tree. We talk about this later. And the other one which contains all the different weapons. 
Now jump into your character blueprint. Let's talk about some of the character systems. Jump into the leveling up event graph. So, for leveling up, all you need to do is call the gain XP event whenever you want your character to gain experience, and the system will do the rest. Jump into the increase stats function if you want to change the amount the stats increase by. And feel free to change the level up pop-up widget that appears after each level up. Here's an example of the AI calling the gain XP event inside its death function. Targeting. I've actually done two tutorials on the functionality of my targeting system already, one called enemy targeting system and one in my badass features video. So instead of explaining the system, I'm just going to throw you the essential information. So you use the E and Q key to switch targets after locking onto an enemy. But you'll notice the E key press isn't here. And that's because it's in the weapon interactions event graph for picking up the weapons. So if you're locked onto a target, E will swap target. And if you're not locked on, we'll pick up a weapon. So the use controller rotation your node makes our character rotate the same way the camera is facing. So I've checked when we're locked onto a target, our character will lock onto the target along with our camera. If you jump into the adjust lock on for roll function, you have a few choices. You can leave it how it is now, and when the character faces the enemy, he will lock on, but not before. Or you can plug the set actor rotation in, coming off the branch. This will make the character constantly rotate towards the target until locked on. Or you can bring in a use controller rotation your node and set it to true coming off the rolling branch true. This will make it so the character is always locked onto the target when he's not rolling. Weapon interactions. Here we have our pickup weapon, which finds overlapping actors using an interface and then calls the pickup weapon if we're overlapping one. To the right, we have two custom events, which are triggered by our draw and sheath weapon anim notifies. When we want to draw a weapon, we call a blueprint interface event in our weapon to attach the weapon to our hand socket. When we want to sheath our weapon, we do the exact same thing, but the weapon attaches to our back instead of our hand. Then we have our actual draw and sheath weapon event triggered by the T key. So we have a load of conditions. Then if we're drawing our weapon, we tell the weapon to resend its animations and details as we're currently using our fist animations. When we pick up a weapon, the weapon is stored in the equipped weapon variable. So when we want to resend our weapon animations over, we send an event over to our weapon using a blueprint interface and the equipped weapon variable. We then reset our attack, which resets a few attack variables. Then we play our draw weapon animation. The exact same thing happens for the sheath weapon, but instead of sending over our weapon animations, we resend over our fist animations. As remember, depending what weapon our weapon enum is set to, it changes our animations. So it would make sense that we set it to our weapon when we draw our weapon, so we use weapon animations, and we set it to fists when sheathing our weapon, so we go back to using fists animations. Attacking and blocking. With the left mouse click, we attack. So we go through some attack conditions. If our weapon isn't drawn, we send over our fist animations. As imagine we've just picked up a weapon and we're now using that weapon's animations. If we haven't drawn our weapon, we need to set the attack animations back to fists before attacking. Otherwise our character will fire off weapon attack animations when the weapon is still sitting on his back. So we send off an attack. A macro calculates which attack is next based on our attack counter and we fire an attack. Each attack animation has an anim notifier attached to it near the end of the animation. This will fire off our attack combo event. So if we left click to attack again, when an attack is being fired, we will set save attack to true. Then when the anim notify triggers our attack combo event, if our save attack is true, we will send off the next attack. And that's how we combo. When our attack combo reaches the max number of weapon attacks, we will reset everything and loop through the attacks again. Okay now, what's in this scary attack function? So first we calculate our weapon damage. This multiplies our weapon base damage, which is set when picking up a weapon, by our combo damage multiplier, which increases by 0.5 every combo attack, by our current player level. Next in our damage function, we have a attack coming from player blueprint interface event. I'll talk more about this later, but like it says on the comment, it's used for triggering slow motion and assassinations. 
I'll talk more about dealing damage later in the video, but all our damage actually comes from the weapon blueprint, not our character. So what we're doing here is just passing the output damage to our weapon after we did all the damage calculations. Then we're playing the attack animation and we're damaging our stamina. For blocking, if our weapon isn't drawn, we'll set our animations to fists to make sure we're playing the fist block animation and not the weapon block animation. We'll then drain our stamina and we'll set our block variable to true, which will make our character block in the animation blueprint. If we're stunned and block is still held down after the stun, we'll put our block up then. When we release our right mouse button, we'll set the block variable to false and we'll stop draining our stamina. Dealing and taking damage. So like I said, the actual damage dealing happens in our weapons. So let's hop into a weapon blueprint and explain that quickly. So in our weapon, we first set its info. Then when we try to pick up a weapon with the E key, when interacted with, we send over our details to our character and we attach the weapon to our character's back socket. We also add the weapon to our character stats struct for when we're saving the game. But don't worry about that just yet. If we've already got a weapon equipped, we tell that weapon to remove itself from the character stat struct and to swap locations with the new weapon. So here we send over our weapon information to the character, populating the character animation variables with our weapon animations. Here we've got our attaching to player hand or back, called by the character but triggered by the anim notify. Here we're receiving the calculated damage from our character blueprint and saving it as a variable. Here we have our line trace, which generates a collision during the start of our weapon swing via an anim notify. And here we're removing that collision during the end of a swing triggered by an anim notify. We use an array to prevent ourselves from hitting the same target more than once for all weapons apart from the daggers. Then we pass over a load of information to the enemy we're hitting, things such as damage, weapon particle system, etc. If you don't know how the applied damage node works, I've done an entire tutorial on that specific node. So be sure to check that out. Down here, we're adding our weapon to our character stat struct. And here we're removing it and placing the weapon on the floor when dropped. And finally, when our player dies, this event gets called and it detaches our weapon and simulates physics. So the AI's weapons are basically exactly the same. And theoretically speaking, we could have used the same weapon for our character and AI. However, it was simpler making them separate in terms of equipping, unequipping and loading game reasons. So the way our weapon deals damage is by using the apply damage node triggered by a line trace, which sends the information over to the enemy via an event damage node. So with that in mind, let's jump back into our character. As you can see, our character takes damage the same way via an event damage node. So what's all this doing? Let's start at the bottom. Here we have our pop-up damage text, which is triggered when an enemy takes damage, easily removed if unwanted. Further up, we have an event which is triggered when an enemy blocks one of our attacks, making us play an animation and stopping us from attacking briefly. And then we have our event damage, triggered when we take damage. If we're blocking, we'll check if we're blocking facing the attacker. If we are, we'll tell the enemy we've blocked an attack. This is the same event we just talked about when our attack was blocked, but for the enemy. Then we'll play a block impact animation, spawn a block particle system and reset our attack variables. If we fail to block, we'll run a take damage function, lowering our health, playing an impact animation and playing the enemy's weapon particle system at the point of impact. If our health is zero, we'll run a death function, turning us ragdoll, stopping movement, etc. And if our health isn't zero, we'll be stunned briefly. Stamina control. When you want to lower your stamina, you'll call an event called damage stamina specifying how much stamina you want to drain or if it's a constant drain. If it's a set amount of stamina, we'll reduce that stamina, stop our stamina from regenerating, and then after a couple of seconds, we'll begin to recover stamina again. If it's a constant drain of stamina, we'll call the drain stamina function. Our drain stamina function is spam called by our timer event. We'll drain one stamina every 0.1 seconds until our stamina is fully drained. When we let go of our block, we'll call a clear and invalidate timer by handle node, stopping our event from being spam run. This means the timeline can finally run its course. After a set amount of seconds, we'll begin to recover stamina again. The amount of time we need to wait before our stamina can regenerate can be set in the timelines. 
Our recover stamina will do the opposite of our drain stamina and increase our stamina by one every 0.05 seconds until full. The not enough stamina widget will appear when you try and use an ability when you don't have enough stamina. Initial setup and input. When we load into a level, our initial setup will run. We will set up fists, which will spawn the fists blueprint and attach them to our hands, and we'll load our fist animations onto our character. When we press control, we'll crouch, and when we press it again, we'll stop crouching. When we press space, we'll roll, briefly increasing our movement speed if we're crouched, damaging our stamina, and calling the event adjust movement speed. Then we'll play a roll animation with a delay, then reset any changes we made at the start of the roll. The adjust movement speed event just says, if we're not moving when we roll, add a movement input to prevent us rolling on the spot. The movement input looks really scary, but don't worry, it's not. All these blueprints on the right have just been added to prevent us from glitching out when we're strafing, walking backwards. We simply add a small amount of right or left movement when walking backwards to prevent our strafe movement blend space from jumping from one side to another, resulting in a glitchy look. These nodes here are just reducing the speed of our character while he's rolling. And as our input axis move forward and right are constantly firing off like event ticks, we've made a macro with some conditions on whether to generate footstep noise. Basically, we don't make noise if we're stood still, crouched, or rolling. If none of those conditions are true, then we'll fire off the generate noise event. If you're in Unreal Engine version 4.25, your nodes will look like this. This basically uses AI perception via hearing to send messages to the AI controller that we're generating noise. If you're in Unreal Engine version 4.26, for some reason I couldn't get the AI perception to work, I'm not sure if it's a bug or what's going on, so I just had to manually send the messages to the AI controller that we're generating noise. So now we're on to assassinations, but before we talk about assassinations, we're gonna go through our enemy AI blueprint as there's a few back and forth events between the character blueprint and the AI blueprint. So let's jump into the AI blueprint. The AI blueprint is very similar to the character blueprint. For dealing and taking damage, everything is very similar, but if an attack is blocked, the player won't be stunned unless the player is locked onto the enemy. I did it like this because when fighting more than one enemy, it's nearly impossible to get off a swing without getting stunned, as if any one of those enemies are blocking, the character will get stunned. So I made it so just the locked on target can stun you. The only other difference is that the pop-up text events are triggered here, either sending the damage caused or a block or parry pop-up. The attacking is exactly the same as the player, so I won't be re-explaining this. Weapon interactions. The weapon interactions are very similar, but the draw and sheath weapons are triggered by events instead of key presses and are therefore separate. And just like the character, the AI animations are dependent on the equipped weapon enum. So we set this to none when sheathing our weapon, and we set it back to the weapon when drawing the weapon. As the AI start with a weapon and don't pick one up, all the weapon info is stored in the setup weapons function. When you bring an AI into the level and select which weapon it should equip in the details, then press play, these nodes are run. Setting up the weapon info depending on which weapon you selected in the AI details. The weapon info populates all the animations, damage, etc. Then the weapon enum, which controls the AI animation, is stored as a reference and reset to nothing. We do this so when the AI spawns in the level, they are playing the default blend space, which is played when the enum has no value. We only set the weapon enum back to the weapon value when we draw the weapon, making them play their weapon blend space. We then spawn the set weapon, give the weapon a reference so the weapon knows which AI it needs to attach to, and we equip and sheath the weapon. All right, time for slow motions and assassinations. So it all starts with our character attack. When we fire off a swing, we send a attack coming from player event to the AI. This, then depending on a load of conditions, can either call the kill cam or assassination event. I'm not gonna go through the conditions and nothing needs changing, but if you'd like to change the frequency of slow motion kill cams, you do that inside the slow motion conditions function. For slow motion, we run the kill cam event, which triggers a macro with a load of functionality in. Inside the macro, I've actually commented each and every node, so I won't go into detail explaining them, but don't worry, the comments will tell you exactly what's going on. Okay, assassinations. 
So we run the assassinate event if all the conditions return true when an attack is coming from the player. So we turn off AI logic and turn his walk speed down to zero to prevent the AI from walking off while he's getting assassinated. We fire off an event to the player telling him to continue the assassination functionality. But before we go to the player, we change the player's camera to one of two choices, depending on if he's got a two-handed sword equipped. Before you change the player camera, if you've got multiple cameras inside your AI blueprint, I found out that you have to disable the other cameras in your blueprint and activate the one you want to use, otherwise it won't work. So then we continue inside the player blueprint, following the assassinate event sent by the AI. We create a reference to the AI we're assassinating, and we move our character into a position directly behind the AI so the animations line up. This distance can be adjusted by changing this integer value. Then we basically reset our character's animations and variables, disable our input and hide our heads up display. Now, depending on which weapon we've equipped, we output our corresponding assassination animation. Coming off our animation node, we then tell the AI that they're being assassinated and we pass over two inputs. The first is how long the player assassination animation is, minus the set time. And the second is how much we minus from the animation time. So these are used as delays inside the AI blueprint to tell the AI when to play his get assassinated animation. So you change this value to a higher number if you wanted the AI to play his dying animation sooner, or you'd lower the number to make the AI play his dying animation later. We have a delay and then we re-enable our input and heads up display. Now we jump back into the AI and follow the assassinated event we called in our character BP. So the first thing we're doing is using the input animation time as a delay. This was the animation time minus the value. So we spawn a particle system, play our death animation and fire our death function which basically just shuts off our AI and turns him ragdoll. We then use our other input which was the amount we minus from our animation time to delay putting the camera back to the player camera until the entire animation is over. And that's the AI blueprint done. Almost there guys, keep it up. Okay, patrol path. So I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but all we're doing here is cycling through the spline patrol points. Every time an AI reaches a patrol point, we run the update patrol sequence, finding the next location in the spline and passing it to the AI so we can head over to it. And that's pretty much it. Okay, the game mode and save game. So all the save game does is hold variables that we want to store for when we restart or load the game. No functionality, just holds variables. Now for the game mode. Our restart level event will delete the save game and restart the level. The save game event saves the character's stats, equipment and location to the save game. You need to call this event every time you want to save. Load game. Call this when you want to load the game, but all it really is is a restart level node. Change level save. We use this to save the game and tell the program to spawn at the start of the level, the player start, as opposed to at a checkpoint. So you want to call this just before you change levels. So first, when we play the level, if there isn't already a save game, one gets created and we call the save game event. When we restart the level or play the level again, as there is now a save game, we continue upwards and we check if our checkpoint variable is true. And then we either respawn with our stats and equipment at the last save location or at the player start. When we save our game, we set checkpoint to true so we can respawn at the save location. This checkpoint variable needs to be changed to false before we change levels. Otherwise we will spawn at the same saved location, but in the new level, not the player start. That's why we need to call our change level save event before changing levels because this changes checkpoint to false. For saving the character's stats, equipment and location, we simply use the player character's information and pass it into our save game slot. For loading, we then retrieve that information from the save game slot and apply it to the character. The set stats and location is pretty simple, but let's go through the spawn equipment as this might confuse you. So we're retrieving the equipped items from the save game and cycling through them with a for loop. Then if we've picked up, say, an epic sword, we're then deleting all the replicas of that epic sword inside the level to prevent us picking up an item we've already picked up. We're then spawning the weapon and sending all the information over to our character. After we've got all the information on our character, we then clear our equipment save game. 
This prevents us having a duplicate copy of an item the next time we save. And this cycle loops. We save the game, restart, spawn the equipment, clear our save, and we save our game again with our new equipment. So the checkpoint is quite simply an overlap box which sets our save game checkpoint to true and then calls the save game event. After the checkpoint has been taken, it tells the save game that it's been used and deletes itself next time the game loads. The change level blueprint was just created to show you how to change levels. Like I said, we call the change level save to disable our checkpoint variable, then we open up the next level. Now we've got AI behavior to explain and we're done. Keep it up. To give the AI behavior, we bounce between three things. The behavior tree, which holds all the different behaviors of the AI. The AI controller, used to change and hold certain variables. And a service. This is actually part of a behavior tree, but it tells the behavior tree which behavior it should follow. So let's jump into our AI controller. We run our behavior tree and we create a ref to the AI. Then, depending on which weapon is equipped, we set the range of the weapon. The range changes how close the AI will walk up to the player when he attacks. If the AI is attacked before noticing the player, we tell the AI to turn around and attack the player. Then if the AI sees the player, we tell the AI to attack. And if the AI hears the player, we tell the AI to investigate noise. All the AI controller does is change our variables depending on if the AI can hear or see us which then changes its behavior. You most likely won't need to change anything in this blueprint, apart from adding onto the range when you add a new weapon style. Now, let's jump into the behavior tree and jump into the service. So this service is constantly running and it's telling the program which behavior should be outputted. It runs like a tick and changes the behavior by changing the AI behavior enum. And this enum changes depending on the variables inside the AI controller. It's all commented, so just by reading the comments, you should understand exactly what's going on. Now into the behavior tree. You can see all the different behaviors of the AI, and they're all linked to the AI behavior enum. So when that's changed, we change what behavior is outputted. Okay, the main rule of thumb, the AI controller changes certain variables. Our service then changes our AI behavior enum based on those variables. And the behavior tree uses the enum to pick a new behavior. It's quite simple. And that, my friends, is all the essential parts of the system. There's a few other things like widgets, but they're pretty self-explanatory. And I've created tutorials in the past which go over these. So good job, guys, we did it. That was a huge amount of information, so don't expect to understand everything straight away. Have a play around with the system and come back to this video for reminders on what does what. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoy the system and honestly, your support means more than you know. Before you go, if you like the system, it would be really cool if you could drop a nice review on it on Epic Games Marketplace. Or if there's something you're not happy with, please drop a comment under this video and I'll do my best to make it better for you. Again guys, thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure. See you in the next video. Right.